It's a pleasure to be actually at NYU. I'm trying to think if I ever been to the med school here, and so this may be my first time that I'm giving a talk here. I visited you before, and and indeed, uh, you know, being actually hosted by the neuroscience program and the institute, you know, my instinct would be to talk about neuroscience, which we do also in the lab a little bit. Uh, but uh, today, actually, I came to tell you a little bit about the other part of the lab, which is what we call the Science of Success Lab. And fundamentally, really, I'm a network scientist, which means that uh, what my lab studies is the structure of networks, like the, like the internet, how the computers are connected to each other, uh, and how we communicate through that network. But, but on my Harvard Medical School identity, I spent quite a bit of time looking at this particular network, which is really the network of proteins linked to each other by various protein-protein interactions. And the reason we deeply care about this is because we believe that this network really is the essence for us to understand disease. And when a disease occurs, actually, it's parts of this network break down. And we believe so much that we actually, three years ago, my colleague Joel Oscazo has even funded the network, uh, uh, the network medicine division within Harvard that has more than 200 researchers working in this very topic. But also, parts of my lab are actually occasionally looking at, uh, at networks like that, which is kind of the organizational network that we're all part of. So the nodes are us, and the links tell us whom do we talk to each other, whom do we talk to on a regular basis. And you know, I even funded many years ago a company who would map out the organizational network between companies, universities, and so on, and try to understand the leaders of the organization, how the structure helps or actually impairs progress in that particular case. So, and, but all this research really is about the structure of the network, like how does the network look like? And you know, kind of about eight, 10 years ago, we started wondering about well, it's interesting to think about the network, the organization, the university, the company, but how about the nodes themselves within the company, within the uh, university and so on? And to what degree your position in the network will actually help or impair your success? And, and when we started this research with one of my students, Dashun Wang, we thought this would be a network question and we thought we would start with scientists. And, and we would look at how the network in which we're embedded in will empower our scientific success. But then we soon realized that the problem is much bigger than a simple network question. And, and that's kind of what I will be talking about, that we have to kind of get uh, acquainted with, with concepts that go well beyond networks. But don't despair, we'll come back to networks and we'll talk about that aspect as well. So in order to talk about uh, generally the role of this network in general success, we need to distinguish two very different things that are familiar to all of us, performance and success. And, and, and of course, this is something that we all know, that we must have performance in order to have success, and that these are actually kind of different things. Well, how different they are? And for that, I'm gonna propose now a working definition that I will go systematically apply throughout this lab class or this lecture, which is simply, say, <coughs> which will effectively say, the performance is something that you do, hence your performance is about you. you. But uh, so it's like what papers you publish, what paintings you paint, uh, what songs you write, how you sing, and so on. But your success is really about us in the sense that success is about how the community uh, observes and eventually appreciates your performance and you know, eventually rewards you for that. So the reason why this is distinction is important is because performance, as we will see, often is very difficult to measure, but because your success is about us, it becomes a collective measure, and there are lots of data points about your success in the community, so it becomes easier to quantify it. And being myself officially now rebranded as a big data person after being a network scientist, because most people don't know what the network scientists do, but they know they think they know what big data people do. <laughs> you know, uh, actually, success becomes a big data problem. So let's kind of see what does it mean really that performance is about you and success is about us, and to show an example of how we often mix these two things together. So let's talk about Novak Djokovic, who's a tennis player, and there's lots of different ways you can actually talk about how successful player he is. You can talk about how many people are Googling him on the internet, what's his ranking on tennis, what's his score points, uh, how many wins and losses did he have, how many people visit his Wikipedia page, and how much money he earns from winnings or from endorsements. 
But really, when we kind of have all of these, and these are all good measures of Novak Djokovic's success or prominence as a tennis player, we're missing, we're mixing together performance and success. Because what you have on the, on the left-hand side is really his performance measure, his wins or losses, score points, ranking, and the winnings are all determined by his performance on the court. However, what's on the right-hand side is something that we give to him by, by being curious about his performance and how many people search on him on Google, Wikipedia searches, as well as the endorsement money, which of course depends on his performance, but it's really about his name recognition. So, so what we were curious about, to what degree can actually the performance determine success across different areas? Well, we might as well start in sports where performance can be uh, uh, precisely measured. So that was why we actually like sports because we have a good performance measure. And so, so we said, let's, let's have a challenge and predict some of the success measures entirely from performance. Which one would be that? Well, we actually chose the Wikipedia visitations. Why is that? Well, we all know Wikipedia, we experience it, but we may not know is that Wikipedia is a very sensitive measure of visibility because we can track how many people are watching a certain page in a given moment. We don't know who the people are, but we know how many people are watching that page. And so therefore, we have actually a very sensitive hourly breakdown of the curiosity of the people about one individual, and that's what you see in case of Novak Djorkovic on this particular plot. So the challenge we ask yourself is that obviously this is a success measure, right? Like it's a community's reflection on, uh, on what he does, but could we predict this entirely from what he does on the field? That is, when he plays, whom he plays a gun, and so on. And, and, and for that, we had to build, obviously, a formula, which looks like that, right? And what this formula does is that on the right-hand side, you only have performance measures. That is, that whom he plays, how is that person ranked compared to him, the timing of the game, the ranking of the, how important the game, and so on. And on the left-hand side, what you have is how many people we think that would be curious given that performance that day and visit his Wikipedia page. Actually, it's not daily, it's a weekly breakdown, but it works the same. And actually, it turns out that this formula works very well. And here is the data that the formula predicts, the red line, and you see that it very accurately tracks of what he does, right? And the reason why this formula works so well is because in tennis, it's truly true what our teachers and, uh, and uh, parents have always told us is that performance drives success, and in order to be successful, you have to have performance, right? So, so this, is, this one, we can just shelf it away and say, yes, indeed, when it comes to sport, it's certainly true that performance drives success, but then I'm gonna tell you something very strange next, and I will tell you that mathematically, performance and success are very different animals, and I will express it in the terms that performance is bounded and success is unbounded. So let's pack it out of what that means. So let's talk about first performance. Well, again, sports is a good analogy to talk about performance because we have chronometers to measure performance, right? And everybody recognizes this person for a good reason. He's the fastest person on earth. But what is interesting actually about him is that when we actually go ahead and measure his performance compared to his competitors, it turns out that despite his fame, and his proud, proudness you know, for, for what he does, his performance is virtually indistinguishable from the people he's competing with, meaning that he runs only half a percent faster than the one who loses the game. And even though he's, a, he's the fastest person on earth, and I'm not a good runner at all, he's not running 10 times faster than I do, right? And what we see actually here is a reflection of every time that we can measure human performance. If we really measure an individual performance, we find that is bounded, mathematically meaning that it follows what we call an exponential distribution, and the consequences of an exponential distribution is that those at the top are almost indistinguishable. There are very, very tiny differences for those at the top. So meaning that every time we are measuring performance, we see that yes, it's easy to distinguish the weak runner from the strong runner, but it's very, very difficult to actually distinguish the strong runners from each other. And one wonderful example of, of even in sports, the difficulty of actually kind of distinguishing performance, I guess I don't have control over this, is that, that in the Rio Olympics, 
uh, Michael Phelps had to actually share the bronze prize with two other players, including one swimmer, uh, a swimmer from Hungary, and not because no one, they didn't know in the Rio Olympics who arrived first, but they could not distinguish who swim faster because the tolerance of the swimming pool was three centimeters, and the time difference in the arrival between them was less than that it takes to swim trans three centimeters at their speed. So even in sports, it's almost impossible to measure in some cases the, the top performers from each other, and that's what we see across all areas. That's about performance. How about success? Let me show you actually an example that happened here in New York to me. When my second book, General Audience book, Burst, came out, I was here in New York and talking with my editor, and you know, we were curious who is the competition, <laughs> right? And so we looked at the New York Times bestseller list and we saw that Lost Symbol just came out that week, Dan Brown was number one, obviously, and uh, Lost Song, another uh, uh, almost the same title, right, was number two by Nicholas Sparks. And so when you looked at the New York Times bestseller list, it was easy to assume that if Nicholas Sparks' team works a little harder, it could easily and unseat uh, uh, Dan Brown. Yet it wasn't the case when we looked at the data. When we started looking at data, we said, let's see how many copies did actually Nicholas Sparks sell. And he sold a huge number of copies. He sold about 100,000 copies that week, which you should know is that typically you can get on the top of the New York Times bestseller list with about 30,000 copies a week. And, and so 100,000 is three times more than what you normally need to get there. Yet he wasn't number one. Why wasn't? Because there was Dan Brown who sold 1.2 million copies that weekend, right? So, and this is actually reflecting the fact that performance is unbounded. That it mathematically, it means that it follows what we call a fat tail or a power law distribution. And it means that the top one is not just 1% bigger than the next one, but can be easily an order of magnitude bigger than the next one. And so, so, so then the challenge for us, of course, is to say, how is it possible that if performance drives success and performance is bounded and success is unbounded, you know, how, what's the relationship between them? And to be honest, there's a whole literature that is really focusing on how can indistinguishable performance lead to kind of huge differences in outcomes, including network science, where I actually, the, the paper that uh, Yuri Buzhaki was referring to was really kind of the theory we built that how is it possible that in the World Wide Web you have huge hubs that have an exceptional number of links and you know, like why, why do they emerge and what's the mechanism and the same mechanisms are responsible for getting this unbounded success across many different areas. We could spend another two hours only on that topic. I would rather instead talk a little bit, come back to academic careers much closer and say, okay, when will that mo magic moment happen when you break through in your academic career? When will that 99 moment happen right? And to, to show that, actually, I'm gonna start with my own career. So this is me, right? This is my scientific career. My first paper I published back in Romania as an undergraduate student, then in Budapest, a bunch of them. And what you actually, and then what you see is horizontally each of my papers in my career and vertically you see their citations, what we call the 10 year citations. So how many citations you got within 10 years, so it'll be comparable to each other, right? So it's not cumulative. And, <clears throat> And so what, if you look at my career, you can see clearly three stages, right? You see that I have about a decade where I work hard. I publish lots of papers and not much comes out of it, right? Hardly any impact, right? So this is that stage of my career. And, and then something happens around 99, 2000, that magic moment that Judy was referring to, and then one high impact paper after the other one happens somehow, right? So, so this was great, and, and it really felt great, you know, and we felt like we have the force with us. So you could say this was that stage of my career. And of course, what my chairman and my dean would like to know is that what happens after that, right? And of course, we don't know what happens after that because not enough time has passed in some of those cases to actually have the impact. So at the end, what you see is like, papers haven't had enough time to collect the, the citations. But the question is that, is that will I have a chance to have another period like that, or have I really entered that particular stage of my career, all right? So, so, you know, this is actually something that I really worry about, you know, is that is it worthwhile for me to kind of carry on trying to write new and new papers? And we'll have an answer by the end of the lecture. And so how do we, so we said, okay, let's go after this question, and let's ask when 
what happens when someone has a high breakthrough, right? So in my case, you could say the highest impact paper was about 13 years in my career, the 63rd paper, right? But when you look at it, it looks like that you could foresee that happening, right? Because before that, there were a couple of outliers already leading to that particular big, uh, big peak, right? So, and also what you can see is that once I had that, you know, I could publish many high impact papers compared to what I did before, right? So somehow I was able to reproduce so I could continue on somehow and also there were precursors. So we said, let's see if this is generally true. So we looked at all scientists and we asked them, for each scientist we identified what was their highest impact paper, whether that had only 100 citations or 20,000, didn't really matter. For each of them we tried to find when did that moment happen. And we moved them all kind of in that moment zero. So this is your magic moment when in your career you do your highest impact uh, uh, publication. And then we said, let's see what the productivity or kind of that's a measure of performance changes and whether I have signals about the possibility that you will have a breakthrough. So we measure productivity leading to that moment. And, and here's what we found. So indeed, this is your magic moment, right? And we see that actually your, the, the productivity was monotonically growing up to that moment and then more or less kind of stabilized. So, so if you look at productivity, there are some signals that something will happen, right? And you don't know when that happened, how long that growth will do, but clearly something is going on. How about impact? Do we see actually that the papers preceding that or following that will have the similar curve? So we did the impact curve as well, and unfortunately wasn't the case. So this is the papers preceding your highest impact paper, right? And after that, this is your highest impact paper, and you see it's flat and flat. This was very disappointing. This actually reminded us of, of a curve in, that in marketing is called the finger curve because it actually tells you that you can see success coming and nor do we seem to learn in it when it comes to really high impact discoveries, right? But okay, so that was somewhat unexpected, but then the question is, when will this moment emerge? At what moment of your career will you write that high impact paper, even if I cannot see that coming? And it turns out that there is lots of literature about that. And, and particularly sociologists and psychologists working on what we call the genius literature have spent lots of time analyzing the career of uh, very high impact individuals and trying to ask the question, when do people make big discoveries? And even famous scientists got into the game. Einstein actually claimed that a person who has not made his great contributions to science before the age of 30 will never do so. Why did he say that? The reason he said that is because when he looked around at his peers who kind of formed quantum mechanics, they were all in their 20s and 30s when they made their major discoveries. With a few exceptions like Planck who was 42, but he was still a youngster compared to what could have been, right? So, so fundamentally, you know, and, and so this observation actually is borne out by data. When psychologists look at the, the highest impact work across many, many domains from science to engineering to medicine and all the way to even arts, there is a predominance of young people making discoveries kind of suggesting that innovation is really the domain of a young person. But the question is, is this really true? Because if that is true, then probably that particular data that I showed is right, that I should really stop writing papers, but I should actually stress writing books now because there's no chance of overcoming my earlier myself. So, but of course, one of the problems about all this literature is that it looks only at high impact discoveries and high impact individuals. And, and you know, many of you are actually working in the medical fields and you know the role of the placebo or the control group, right? that it's not, if you want to really understand the pattern, it's not enough to look at the events themselves. You also look at the, the individuals who did not have the event. And so therefore we said, let's look at all scientists and let's ask at what stage of their career they have made their biggest discovery. Were they young, were they old, and things like that. And this is kind of con putting together all the results. So, so like this, each line is a career of one scientist and a red dot corresponds to that in that career, at that moment of that career was the highest impact discovery. And they're all normalized from zero to one in the sense that all careers were squished together to be roughly on the same length. 
So, and of course, what you see is like most like the surface of a sea with some uh, colors, it's impossible to see a pattern. So we have to quantify that. And one way to quantify that is to, to ask how many years after the beginning of your career you make your highest, you publish your highest impact work. And here we're not talking about age because we're not able to measure age for all scientists. We can only look at the academic age. And the, your, you're born academically when you publish your first paper and then we count years after that, okay? So, so in order to do that, we actually look what's the probability that you will publish your highest impact for, let's say, 10 years after the beginning of your career, 20, 30, or 40. And the answer was this curve, which very much confirmed the genius literature because it showed that really, you know, you have a very high chance of publishing early on your highest impact work, and it kind of peaks at the like year 15 of your career, and after year 20 is just downhill, right? That your chance of publishing your highest impact for your beyond 20 years of your career is really drops very fast. You know, I'm kind of in 30 years into my career, so I'm somewhere here, and I have about 1% chance of publishing a paper that would have a higher impact than any of my, than my, my highest impact paper earlier. Which means that truly based on this data, I'm in that particular category, right? But of course, you need to look at controls. And in this case, the control was that, how would the random scientist do? And what's a random scientist? Well, a scientist where I take my career and I, I keep all my papers, but I change randomly their impact, you know, so I, I exchange their impact randomly so that effectively, you know, like any of my papers could be my highest impact paper. So we did that for all scientists and we said, how, what, when would the highest impact work appear for, for, for kind of like the random scientist? We kind of expected the flat curve that it, uh, or, or I'm, uh, because it's completely random and to our surprise, the data was indistinguishable from the real scientist. And to make a long story short, what did actually this mean? That if you look at a random scientist, you're really measuring the productivity. Because if I randomly flick your papers around, any of your papers could actually be your highest impact work. So, so the, your chance of publishing it in 10 years, your highest impact work is really, what's the chance that you publish a paper in that time? So therefore, the reference curve is nothing but your productivity. And what was telling us is that the productivity and the impact curve are totally indistinguishable, which had only one interpretation, which is meaning that every single paper in your career has exactly the same chance of being your highest impact work. And, and let me just show that that's indeed the case. <clears throat> so, so here we actually lined up scientists from the beginning of their end, end of the career. So we squished them to all have the same length. Each paper, is, each dot is a paper. The orange dot corresponds to the highest impact paper on that line. The three black lines correspond to three Nobel Prize winners, just for reference, right? But the rest are ordinary scientists. And here I'm showing what's the probability that the highest impact paper came in the first tenth, the second or the last tenth of your career in the terms of papers and it's completely flat. Meaning that every single project in our career, the data indicates has exactly the same probability of being your highest impact work independent of age. That is each paper we do is like a lottery ticket that has the same chance of winning the lottery as any other one. But because when we are young, we're eager and we write lots of papers, we buy many more lottery tickets at the first 20 years of your career and we start buying less and less later in their career. So, and that's why actually it looks like that we're making much of the discoveries early on, but really innovation really has no age, productivity does. Which is kind of good news for people with graying hair like myself, because it really tells us you never know when your hit comes. It could be with the same probability your first or last paper of your career. And indeed, there are beautiful examples for that. Let's look at uh, Frank Wilczek, who got the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2004 for the very, very, very first paper he ever wrote in his career as a graduate student, right? He had to wait 40 years for it, but it was his very first paper. And of course, even more beautiful is John Flan who got the Chemistry Nobel Prize in 2002 for a paper that he wrote after he was forcefully retired from Yale. And not only that he was forcefully retired, but, but he actually, he already had the idea, and then he actually moved to the uh, Commonwealth Virginia University, 
And it's there where he published the paper. And he couldn't publish it at Yale because he shut, they shut his lab down you know, by forced retirement. And, and, uh, and then, of course, the irony of the story is that this also became a huge commercial success because this was ion spray ionization. It allowed you to measure the, the mass of the proteins. And then Yale came back to me and took all the patents away from him because they showed that he had the idea already at Yale, except that he couldn't do it because he didn't have a lab. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, but what it actually shows that really kind of good demonstrates very nicely that, you know, like it's no, the innovation has no age. You have the opportunity to act on the innovation where it actually has an age. And the people who actually stay productive later in the career have just, they could be just as impactful as those who are. Uh, uh, you know, doing that young. So, so that's the good news, right? So if, as long as you carry on, you still have a chance and you always knew a new chances for it to be successful at your scientific career. But then let's also face another aspect of the scientific career. The question is, let's assume that you make the discovery. The question is, will you get the credit for it? So let's talk about that. Credit is a tricky issue in science, right? There's no question who relativity belongs to because it was published by Einstein as a single author paper. And no one actually questions so much Darwin's ideas uh, and, and his source of idea for the origins of species, even though it's pretty well known that other people, you know, Wallace came up with the same idea independently, but the book had only one author. But the question is, we now live in the era where we rarely ever actually publish single author papers, right? We share the credits with our collaborators, with our bosses, with our students, and so on. So then the question is, where does credit go in this case? Who should get the Nobel Prize for that particular paper? This is a Nobel Prize winning uh, paper in high energy physics. And those of you who come from high energy physics, you know exactly who the Nobel Prize should go to, right? Obviously to these two authors, <laughs> right? So, so the question is, how do we decide? How does the Nobel Prize Committee decide about where the credit should go for a discovery with 135 authors? And what I will tell you next is that there's actually data to, to help us understand that, and this is actually very predictable. And to understand that, let me show you two examples of Nobel Prize winning papers. So there's actually a Nobel Prize for 2010 for chemistry, and it was for the paper that published by Baba and Nagishi, and Nagishi got the Nobel Prize and Baba didn't. What happened there? Well, we don't know what happened, but when we look at the five most co-cited papers with that particular discovery, they all have Nagishi on it and we don't have Baba anywhere. So what that indicates, obviously, that this paper was the journey of Nagishi, you know. It was his line of research. And Baba was there for the ride in one particular paper, happens to be the first paper that made the discovery, but he did not continue that line of research, right? Or whatever he did, he was not, didn't make any high impact work after that. However, look at this other paper. So obviously then Nagishi not the Rover Prize. Well, how about here? No cell of end game. This is actually the graphene Nobel Prize. And when you look at the most co-cited papers with that paper, they all have Game and Nocelov together as co-authors. So it's clearly, it's part of their joint journey and therefore both of them actually got the Nobel Prize. But these are extreme cases. Could we actually go ahead and give a number to say what's the likely, what's the credit that goes to Nagishi and what's the credit that goes to, uh, to uh, uh, Baba? And we can, we actually have a formula for that. We published in PNAS a few years ago, 2014. And what this looks at is actually looks at, at the paper that you care about and say, what other papers written by the same authors and that are co-cited with that particular paper and whose papers are co-cited? And that actually is a matrix formula that the end kind of gives a credit share to each author on a particular paper. And to show that this is actually works very, very well, let's go back to that. And when we apply to the Baba and Nagishi paper, our algorithm says that 72% of the credit should go to Nagishi, 28 to Baba, and indeed he got the Nobel Prize. And our, our algorithm says that the credit is totally split, half and half between uh, uh, no, no cello and game, and indeed they got joined with part of the prize. But how do you know that you're right? Because this is an anecdotal example, right? So we wanted to find an example where we know where the credit goes and we could test our algorithm. And of course, those are the Nobel Prize winning papers. 
So we said, let's take every single Nobel Prize winning papers in the last 25 years. Since the Nobel Prize committee actually has officially said which paper they're giving the prize. Before that, they wouldn't. They just give it to a person. But now they actually explicitly say, this was a discovery and this was the reference. And you see, this is physics and chemistry, and we did it for other medicine and so on. And each, each kind of line corresponds to the papers that got the Nobel Prize. And here, of course, a single author paper. This is two authors. And here are the multiple authors' papers. And we put a red dot if our algorithm predicted right that the highest credit should go to the person who actually got the Nobel Prize. And we put a black dot when we failed, right? When we actually mispredicted that. And we're very curious about, not only we're happy with the success that most of the time we got it right, we were curious, why did we fail, right? And it turned out, and of course there were not so many cases, so we could look into each of them, and each of them turned out to be a very interesting, unique, and often very juicy story. And so let me tell you one that is probably familiar to many of you in this audience, but not to all, and this is the 2008 Nobel Prize in Chemistry, which is over there, that went to three individuals, and our algorithm said that it should have gone to one only, which is the fourth one that was on that paper, but not on the other ones. And this is a Nobel Prize that many in this room know and use, right? Because this is, the, this is the GFP Nobel Prize. For those of you who are not biologists, this is the molecule that lights up really the cells and the specific genes or proteins uh, in the cell. These colorful images that come from biology labs are all thanks to GFP and has revolutionized biology and medical research in general. And, and of course, well-deserved. No one questions the fact that this paper should have got, well, this particular discovery should have been given a Nobel Prize, except that our algorithm actually insisted that the prize should not go to these three gentlemen, but should go instead, or also, you could say, to Douglas Prazier, because he was ranked above any all three of them. And of course, those of you who don't know the story, you know, we actually started to look of who Douglas Prazier is and couldn't find him in any research institutions. Then we looked even further, and he was not in a, in, a, in a private research lab either. So eventually he was tracked down by a journalist, and he was working as a, as a Toyota van driver at the Toyota dealership. So he would take your car to the, uh, uh, he would take you home if your car broke, and then would drive you back to pick up your, uh, your fixed car. He was in Alabama, if I remember right. So then the question is, what happened? Why did our algorithm insist that the Toyota driver, actually a van driver, should be given a Nobel Prize? And the story is now well known. So Douglas Prazier was the one who actually came with up the idea that, that jellyfish probably has, we know jellyfish can fluorescence, and there's probably one protein or one gene responsible for that. And he was at Woods Hole, and he cloned that gene for the first time. And he published it and he wrote the grant saying, now I want to take that gene and put it into other cells to use it actually to kind of uh, uh, to turn genes on. And his grant got turned down. And he got so disappointed and other things were going on in his life that he simply quit. But before he quit, he said, well, I don't want all my work lost. So therefore he took two files and send the two the genes that he discovered, actually, the clo uh, to Martin Chalfi and Roger Tsin. Why did he send it to them? Because they were the only researchers back then interested in his work, and they wrote letters to him saying that we'd be curious of what you're doing with this. And, and Roger and Martin have actually acknowledged his, uh, the fact that he sent them by putting him co-author on the first paper. But of course, he vanished from the face of Earth, he was nowhere to be found. And you know, when it comes to actually getting the Nobel Prize, who would recommend someone that no one knows where he is, whether he's alive or not, right? So, so what, what happened here is clearly the performance was there because he published the first cloning paper, plus he was on the two other papers, right? That's why our algorithm was telling us that he should be getting the Nobel Prize. He gets most of the credit. But what he was not part of is of the network, the professional network that eventually, among other things, recommends people for Nobel Prize, right? So which means that we're back to networks. And before we go back to networks, let's kind of summarize to that and something that you, many, there are many students in this room. And what you need to understand is that credit is based not on, not, is based on perception and not on performance, right? Is that so, and this is something that I tell every single student of mine in my lab or postdoc of my mind when I come, and they say, listen, 
in the moment you're not going to publish a paper in network science, that's my paper. Because no one knows who you are. And you're going to have to go out and convince the community that you exist and this is your line of work. And only after that the community will actually start giving credit for that work and that will by itself not be enough. You need to go and publish other papers independently of me of high impact in the same area so that the community will slowly shift the credit from me to you. And I had students who have done that very successfully and I have other students who didn't care much about that. But I think you know, this is something that we have to be very deeply aware of as we are continuing, particularly those who are starting your career, that is not enough to be part of the great team. You also have to convince the community that you were not simply bringing the coffee to the team, but you were actually the, the source of the ideas or the execution of that project, and you can carry on with that. So, so and one of the reasons, of course, is because at the end, there are these invisible networks that decide where credit goes and how it's being assigned, which leads actually to the last part of the talk that I offered in the title, which is what happens when performance is totally unmeasurable. Right? So what's, let's, get, let's take the extreme situation where we totally are unable to measure performance and the question is how does success emerge in that case? And of course that's the example of arts. Right? Is this an art object? Or is it a photo taken at the junkyard? <laughs> right? And obviously those of you who in this room who know arts, they know this is a very symbolic, very, very important piece of art right? by Marcel Duchamp. Those of you who have no idea, you know, you would actually have to pay them to take it away, right? So, and why is that? Is because, you know, in art, performance is inherently unmeasurable. And this is not to say that there's no value in art. It's just we cannot look at the art object independent of its environment, of where it's being exhibited and who did it and so on, and decide of its value. But rather the recognition, the value, and the success is determined by these invisible networks of who did it, where was it exhibited, is this in the junkyard, or is this in MoMA, right? And all these other variables, and who thinks that this is a piece of art versus who thinks that it's just junk, right? So, so, so from my perspective, art is really interesting because clearly there are huge successes in art, and you'd be curious, how do they emerge? And a few years ago, two years, three years ago, we had a fantastic uh, uh, you know, opportunity to answer that question, thanks to uh, 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 Magnus, right? <laughs> so, uh, who's sitting here, right? And he provided us a fabulous data set that from 1980 to 2016, and even goes back, had all the galleries, actually, and all the countries, and all the exhibits. To be precise, he had data about half a million artists half a million exhibits and 14,000 galleries, and about a quarter of a million exhibits in 7,000 museums, and lots of auction data effectively covering the full kind of history of the last 40 years contemporary art. And I'm not gonna go into details of what data is in there, actually, uh, because it's really a very unique data set, but what it allowed us to do, actually, is to piece together the career of artists and ask ourselves how does art, our kind of success emerge in art? And in order, and to do so, uh, I'm, well, let's see if I can get to this slide. I, uh, no, I guess I cannot do that. So, so uh, anyway, so what we are actually asking is that how do artists move between institutions and careers? So this is actually a career of a particular artist that I cannot show because this WebEx is kind of messing me up. But fundamentally, this person actually had an exhibit first in Bon and Po, then he was exhibited in MoCA, then went to MoMA, then Gogosian Gallery. These are institutions that many of you know. So this is how we can actually trace his career. But we're not so much interested about him, which is by himself is a very interesting uh, uh, artist, but rather the fact of what made MoCA to accept an artist. What was the criteria? And obviously one of the important criteria in art is to say, if you want to come to MoMA, the question is, where were you exhibited before, right? And because, you know, is the, the prestige of the institutions that you managed to, your art managed to kind of enter, really is kind of the ticket to enter either higher level institutions. So by seeing how the artists move between the institutions, we can map out what institutions are considered acceptable for a particular museum or gallery 
as a previous exhibition place to be exhibited in that place. So, and of course we have the equivalent at heart at, at, uh, in science as well, right? If you are graduating from University of Oklahoma or University of Harvard University or NYU, you know, you have very different chances of getting actually admitted in different, pro uh, in various programs. And so, but here we could explicitly map out that and we ended up in a network like that where now nodes are institutions, right? Each one is a gallery or museum. And the links which are hardly visible on this projector really correspond to how many artists move from one museum to one gallery or one gallery to one museum. And the reason why this is actually important is because we were able to map the whole art movement in the last kind of 40 years. And this network by itself gave us the prestige level of the individual institutions. And what you see there is the node size, which we, we consider prestige level. And the way we arrive to that is a little bit to page rank, if you know on, on Google. You know, the question is, who sent you artists and what is their, pre, what is their prestige level? So it's, it's an algorithm that it's called eigenvalue centrality algorithm that you're running on that particular network that only the network itself tells you what is the prestige of each node based on what is the prestige of the nodes that are feeding you with artists. And when we did that, we recovered much of the classical prestige level. So we got that MoMA and Guggenheim and Gogosian galleries are some of the biggest nodes. But we could not only do the biggest galleries because everybody knows who are the most prestigious institutions, but this methodology also allowed us to assign very prestige, presti uh, precise prestige levels to the small institutions as well. And one of the most surprising things on this uh, art map was how fragmented this network was. That if you are an artist, obviously in the center somewhere here, it means that you have access to the, if you're exhibiting in one of these museums here, you have access to the high value institutions. But if you're exhibiting somewhere here, right, some of the German institutions in this particular case, and Eastern Europeans mixed together, you know, you could actually uh, be exhibiting a lot and you could feel that being an important artist, but there is very, very few paths to take you to these very high value institutions over there. So this map revealed the underlying fragmentation of the art world and the difficulty actually getting from one peripheric region to kind of to the, va to the where, where really art, uh, very valuable art emerges. But we didn't stop at this. We asked, could we actually see how your career develops if you start high or you start low? Starting high meaning that you start on one of the top 20% institutions based on that prestige level, or you start from the bottom. And so here is what happens to people who start high, all right? So these are actually the career of about uh, 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 five artists. And you see they start high, that the first five exhibits come in the top institutions, and they, most of the career they stay there. But these are what we call rich club artists or elite artists, but there are very few of those. Most artists really start at the bottom of, uh, of the bottom 20%. And some of them actually, and many of them actually stay there. Some of them are lucky enough to actually move up. The question is, what's the chance to really move up in this prestige space? And, and this, is, this map is kind of summarizing it. If you are actually starting at the top, you have 57% chance of staying there, and the rest kind of goes into the middle range, only 0.3% of actually drop to the bottom. That is, if you start high, you stay high or in the vicinity of the high. So, and the reason for that is because really it's almost impossible to measure performance in art. So like if the high institutions kind of can accept you, there's a vested interest for you to be actually camped in that region. However, if you start low, you know, you, uh, with some percentage, you're gonna stay here. If you survive long enough, you have about 10% chance to go up. Uh, and this is actually a, a high chance because really we're not counting here the, 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 the attrition, those people who didn't actually continue. The bottom line, what you see is that the, er the prestige level of where you reached early in your career is very, very strong predictor of your <coughs> later success. And, and in order to see that, we actually built an algorithm that starts from this network, and this is kind of the formula we don't have to go through, but we start from the first five exhibits of the artist and ask what will happen with his or career from here on. And, and, uh, uh, and let me just show you like uh, four cases over here, what happens in this case. So here's an artist who started high, 
and you see that that actually what we're predicting is the continuous line that's going to stay high and we're going to go further high even higher this is the art that it does you know and you know obviously very high impact art <clears throat> and uh, and indeed that's what happens with his career however here's a person who started low painting these things and we're predicting that it will be a slow rise but will stay in the low region 12 years later and that's exactly what happens Another person we're predicting to go up and it did go up and another person starting high and we're staying is going to more or less stay there and that's exactly what happened to, <clears throat> to him or her. So, so in a way, it's, it's very hugely predictive and the question is why are we so good at predicting future artists' careers? And the reason is because you can't really mess it up easily in art. It's not like running and you break your leg and you're out, right? If you have really managed to convince the, the community that this is actually art and it's worth half a million dollar, then your galleries will convince that when you tomorrow start putting iPhones out that that also has another meaning and that's also art and it's meaningful, right? So, so really, the, so, so there is an inherent inertia in the way that if once you're accepted to be part of the member of the club, you can continue uh, doing that particular line of work. But of course, the question is, you know, how do you go up from the bottom? Like, what are the characteristics? Could, could you go up and what, what distinguishes from those who actually make it to the top from those who didn't? And for that, we actually identify about 250 artists, roughly, who really started low and they made it up. And the question was, what were the characteristics of those? And we found that as a group, they were different from the others who didn't make it up. And one of them is that there was this intensive and relentless search early in their career. That is that they didn't actually follow the, the traditional dictate, have, have you accepted, make yourself accepted by a gallery and that person will take care, gallery will take care of you, but rather they spread very widely. They, they randomly exhibited in multiple places, also in and out of their country. There was geographical diversity in exhibitions and so on. And through that process, by accident, they hit across higher prestige institutions. And what is important is that it's very, very hard to actually see the prestige level from the uh, outside of the top 20% of the institutions because it's like almost in unmeasurable who is better than the other. And the, these guys, by trying relentlessly early on, they accidentally hit across a few institutions who could feed them towards the center of the network, right? So, so overall, you know, that's what we find that, that the pattern that really worked for them is that intensive early shopping around, which is not so different from what we do in sciences, right? Fundamentally, what we do in sciences, you know, as a young uh, person, is that you try to test many ideas and hoping that one of them will stick uh, and, and one of them will, you know, will, will actually be your lottery ticket, your success. So this one, this, with this one, I, actually what I would like to do is kind of conclude by saying, yes, performance is very, very important for, our, uh, for, uh, uh, for success. And nowhere in our research we're finding that success can come without performance, right? This is really not about that. The question is more, what happens when you have lots of people who have very, very high performance? When you have all superb students applying to medical school, right? When you have all superb postdoc candidates applying to your lab. And, and you know, which one of those who have everything to succeed actually will succeed? And, and that's what I would call is not that performance is not measurable, but is not distinguishable. And when you cannot really measure performance or you cannot distinguish performance, then it's not performance alone who determines your success, but lots of auxiliary phenomena. And among one of them, the most serious example is really the networks, right? If I cannot really say who is the better one, then I'm gonna rely on the advice of others for recommendation letters on, on what he or she says and things like that. And of course, this happens in extreme in arts, but it happens also among scientists, right? And we know how important weight recommendations letter uh, have and often over overweight actually even the performance measures of that particular student. And I would like to conclude actually by acknowledging uh, Sam and Magnus, who is actually, Sam is here somewhere off, and uh, Magnus and others who help, you know, who, without whom the artwork could have not been possible. The rest of the team is almost in, uh, impossible to acknowledge because so many people have helped in the earlier research. Uh, they're all co-authors of the paper and hopefully they're fighting for their credit for the work. 
And, and I would like to kind of conclude with the fact that if you want to kind of remember one thing is really your performance is about you, but your success really is about us, right? And, and yes, performance does drive success, but you know, we can't always measure your performance. And when you can't, you have to pay attention to lots of auxiliary things. And in the formula, what I try to do is to summarize some of these research that has happened in the last 10 to 20 years in that space and transit it into a language that we can hopefully a little bit apply to our own life. You tell me if, I, if it worked. Thank you very much for your attention.